are welcome. Amen. Feels like the Oscars. Hallelujah. Praise God. But I truly am grateful to be here. I love you guys. Love this church. You know, it feels like, you know, it feels like Manchester, just warmer. Amen. Same sort of atmosphere, same vibe. And that's down to your leaders. And uh, I really love your leaders, man, your pastors. Pastor Al, Sister Georgina, thank you for having me come. And um, they are the coolest pastors that you know. Amen. Oh, come on now. They're really cool. They're, they're, they're so down to earth. They're so real. Amen. They're seasoned. They've been through a lot. And, uh, they, you know, you, you, you can trust them. You can trust their leadership. And uh, I love hanging out. We have the same, you know, we have the same taste. We even dress the same today, man. It was like, you know, how, how scary is that? I came out, I was like, wow, brother, you know. But praise the Lord. It's, um, it's great to be here. And uh, got a lot of friends here. It's good to see people. Amen. And I bring greetings from my wife. She's, uh, she stayed back in Manchester because we have a church. Amen. And she said, someone's got to do some work while you're out there. Just international traveler. I think she thinks that I'm just, you know, chilling out in hotels and just eating. But, uh, man, we're, we're in meetings, we're doing stuff, and, you know, we're, we're putting in work, amen? But she's back there, and uh, she sends her greetings. If she's watching, man, I love you to the moon and back. Most beautiful girl in the world. And it's her birthday tomorrow, and I'm not going to be there. That's the sacrifice that we make to this ministry, amen, for the, for the Lord. But, you know, I've got some gifts and my kids are well primed. and <laughs> They know where they're hidden, amen. But I just want you to pray with me for the sake of time. I'm going to get straight into this message. And uh, I've entitled it The Best Christmas Ever. I want to preach to you about Christmas in a way maybe you've never seen Christmas before. And you're going to get a revelation of the glory of God and the way that he works in a way that's going to blow your mind. Amen. Are you ready to be mind blown today? Praise the Lord. Help me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place. We ask, oh God, that you would enlarge our capacity to understand who you are. Lord, because there's so much of you. There is so much goodness that you want us to know about, about who you are. And in Jesus' name, we pray that no one would leave this place the same today. We declare that Jesus Christ is the reason for the season and is the reason for every season in our lives. We give him all the glory and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I want you to turn very quickly in your Bible to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read the first seven verses. And um, yeah, you, you can stand for seven verses. Amen. And then you can sit down. And I'm not going to keep you long because I know that uh, we've got another service coming. Luke chapter 2, this is about the lead up to Christmas. It says in verse 1, it says, At that time, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged. He was now expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for a baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Please take your seats. Christmas, for many people, it has uh, a good feel. It's a good vibe. It's a wonderful time. You know, you start hearing the music in like July now, man. It's like, <laughs> you know, what is happening? It's like, is, is it me or is it getting, you, you're hearing Christmas music earlier and earlier every year, right? But I love the music. I love, you know, you put on It's a Wonderful Life again for the 35th time. Amen. You know, die hard if you're, if you're, if you're you know, sinning. Praise the Lord. You know, all of these different Christmas movies. It's a wonderful time. The tree, the smells. My wife always gets candles and she likes the Christmas candles. And, you know, we have the tree and we have all of that stuff. And it's, it's, it's great. It's wonderful. It's a bit stressful. Amen. 
and it can be a little bit expensive. Praise the Lord. Especially if you've got kids like mine. Huh? Back in my day, I used to get a nut and an orange and some socks. Nowadays, they have all sorts of stuff. Amen. Praise the Lord. I can't wait for my son, he's 11, to get to my size. So then I can buy him all the stuff that I want to wear. Amen. <laughs> With my daughter, it's a little bit different. Because I, I, I'm not going to wear her stuff. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but it's a good time for many people. It's a time of family and fun. And the traditional Christmas season, as unsaved people, actually come into church. They come to church at Christmas, at Easter, at some of those times during the year. So it's, it's okay. It's a good thing. There's nativity plays with, with Mary and Joseph. The kids get involved. They have uh, towels wrapped around their heads. Amen. Uh, they're always looking for a little tea towel. Amen. Wrapped around their head. And an old cardigan or an old dressing gown. Mama's dressing gown. And they have Jesus in a stable surrounded by donkeys and uh, other animals. They have shepherds. They have the three kings with their gifts and... This celebration is supposed to be about the birth of the Saviour. But in truth, the timeline of the story sometimes gets a bit mixed up. Because the kings, didn't, the, the kings weren't really kings, they were magi, and they didn't come for another maybe two years. But, you know, we mix it all together in the, the, the nativity thing. In England, we have mince pies. We have punch. We have Christmas pudding. Amen. Non-alcoholic punch in Victory Outreach. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Otherwise, there'd be a few punches thrown, I'm sure. Huh? The tree is decorated. There's Christmas lights everywhere. People open their gifts on Christmas Day in England. But the traditions are different in different countries. And uh, we have to understand that traditions are different everywhere you go. Not everyone celebrates it on the same day. In Holland, I've been in Holland... And on December the 5th, they have Sinterklaas Day. Sinterklaas is the Dutch for Santa Claus, right? And he has this little dude called Schwarzer Pete, Black Pete. He has this little black dude that runs around with him, right? <laughs> and the little black dude, like, he goes out and gives all the gifts. And there's a big outcry in Holland at the moment, and they're saying it's racist. They've been doing this for hundreds of years. <laughs> little Black Pete. Now, little Black Pete's getting lighter in colour. He's like... You know, they're trying to get rid of Black Pete. But they do it on, 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 on December the 5th. In other countries, it's December the 24th when they open their gifts, right? In the East, in the, in, in the East it's, it's January the 5th or January, January the 6th. It's all different traditions, and people do it in different ways. Not everyone eats turkey at Christmas either. In Jamaica, they have saltfish and curry goat. An oxtail, come on now. Rice and peas and ting, you know what I mean? <laughs> In Australia, they have it on the beach. All these traditions. But how many of you know tra the traditions might change, but traditions don't set you free? It's the truth that sets you free. And there's a lot of people who get very traditional on, on stuff, and they want to hold on to their traditions. But the traditions keep you comfortably bound. Or as Pink Floyd used to sing, comfortably numb. Hello. Huh? But the traditions don't set you free. And for other people, Christmas is a nightmare. It's a place of loneliness, depression, when they ain't got no money. I, 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 I've been incarcerated at Christmas before. Come on now. Banged up in a cell. Come on now. I know a bit of turkey. I'm looking, I'm looking outside, looking at sparrows and pigeons and that thing, and I'd eat you right now. <laughs> huh? Sometimes Christmas can be disappointing for people. They're lonely. They're on their own, you know, and they open a recycled gift that they gave you last year. Hello. Traditional Chris Christmas. Huh? These people don't need traditions. They need truth. Because God's truth sets us free. The truth about what Christmas is actually celebrating is really when you get beyond all the tinsel and all the lights and bells and whistles and smells, it's actually more amazing than most of us realize. See, nobody knows exactly when Jesus was born. There's much conjecture as to whether it would be in September 
or October, around those types of feasts, the Jewish feasts of Rosh Hashanah, um, the New Year, um, the Jewish New Year. But in truth, that's not the important thing. Because at Christmas, the church is not celebrating the exact date of Jesus' birth. We're celebrating the facts of Jesus' birth. And even though the Roman Catholic Church might have hijacked, you know, some old Roman and old Iranian, you know, uh, uh, celebrations of Mithras and Saturnalia, and they wanted to put a Christian stamp on it, you know, people get bent out of shape and they throw the baby out with the bathwater. But the facts are there that Jesus was born, as the Bible says. Regardless of when people think, the fact that he was born is indisputable. Can someone say amen? amen? And these facts give us evidence to hang our faith onto. Some of you know faith is evidence. It ain't just, if you've got blind faith, then you ain't got real faith. My faith is in the facts of Jesus Christ. And there are so many facts about God and creation and the person of Jesus Christ that you don't need to be one of them. You know, when I don't know, I just, you know, I'm just hanging it on just faith. It's just faith. No, facts. Everyone say facts. There's facts. So I want to look at three facts about Jesus' birth real quick that is going to blow us away. These things are the place. It's important. The people involved is important. And then the plan of God about Christmas. Are you ready? Should we go in? I mean, we're going in quick, all right? I'm not stopping for you. I'm not waiting for you. I'm going in. If I need to engage you with jokes and humor, then forget it. We ain't got time for that this service. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going in. We're going to get some facts. Are you ready? All right. That's enough pumping. I ain't pumping you up no more. Huh? I'm not here to hype you. I'm here to help you today. Hallelujah. So first we want to look at the place. This will blow you away, man. This blew me away. You know, I was on a mission field in Israel for Victory Outreach. You know, I'm a graduate of the home. I'm an ex-heroin addict. I'm an ex-criminal, right? Um, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a home graduate. Hallelujah. My wife's a home graduate. I've been on a mission field in India. I've been in Israel. I used to run the men's home in Jerusalem. Check that out. Huh? Praise the Lord. And uh, when I was over there, I was around these Jewish people um, that were Christians, that had become Christians. And they, 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 man, they go deep in the scriptures. And I learned a little bit of Hebrew when I was out there. But these things that I learned there blew me away. They've changed my perspective on this whole, this whole thing. First of all, the place that it happened. Why is it so important? Well, the town of his birth was Bethlehem. We already read that. And it means the house of bread. It was the place that was prophesied in scripture about the coming of the Messiah. In Micah, the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, it says this, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. And this is where Mary and Joseph came from Nazareth. There's probably a three-day journey, and they had to come there. Every male had to go to his ancestral home to register for the tax census. The Romans were taxing people, and you had to go back to the place of your birth. Come on now. Some of you would be going back over south over the border. Hallelujah. You'd be going back to Guadalajara or, you know, Oxa Haxa Hoxo or whatever. You know. Some people would be going, you know, back to Africa. Come on now. Hallelujah. Huh? Jamaica. But they had to go all the way back and because Joseph was descended from the royal line of King David. And in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 16, we see his lineage going all the way back. And that's, in, that's, that's, that's important because the Messiah was to be called the son of David. So he had to have the lineage. They had to have a proven lineage going back to David. Mary was also of royal lineage. And she could trace her ancestors all the way back to Adam. Check it out. So it went all the way through. You see this in Luke's genealogy, chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. And this is also important because of what God said to the first couple, Adam and Eve, after their fall in Eden. And he said to them that their seed or the offspring of the woman would crush the head of the nakash, the serpent, right? That, that, that it was, by the way, it wasn't a talking snake. Hallelujah. It was a celestial being, a fallen angel. And this... When, when 
her offspring would reverse the curse. So it had to be proven. And the Bible proves it to us that not only was Jesus a son of David, but also he was a descendant of Adam. He was a real human, in other words. And so they came to Bethlehem and it was packed. There was nowhere to go. And the Bible then just says that Mary then gave birth and wrapped the baby in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, which is another word for a stall. But this is where your mind starts getting blown, man. So let's move on to the people real quick. We're leaving the place. We're going to add this, this next part as well. We're adding the people now to the place. This is going to blow your mind, blow you away. The next part of the story introduces some people. Some of you know God loves people. People are important to God, right? And he uses people to fulfill his plan. It's a power. He don't need us. He don't need you. But praise God, he uses people like us. Amen. To fulfill his plan. First, we see another celestial being, an angel or a messenger of God, and he appears to some shepherds. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read it out real quick. Verse 8 says, That night there were shepherds standing in the fields nearby. You know the song, While well, shepherds wash their socks by night. Amen. Who seated round the tub, the angel of the Lord came down and they began to scrub. You heard it like that? Some of you are like, what is he talking about, man? That's an English thing. They were nearby, they were guarding their flocks of sheep. This is important. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, in the city of David. Now watch this. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village. They found Mary and Joseph and there was the baby lying in the manger. Watch this. This is where it gets good. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Now, why is this important? Because they're simple, humble folk. Why, why, why angels? Sometimes we think that God, you know, because they were humble folk and, you know, they were angels and, you know, came down and the shepherds and nice little shepherds and, you know, sometimes you've heard it, you know, they're just humble folk. This is not that, this is not it. it there's something else, man. Micah the prophet once again helps us to see something powerful. Micah chapter 4 verse 8 says this. It says, O oh you, and you, O oh tower of the flock. O oh you, O oh tower of the flock. In Hebrew, this is the word migdol ada. Migdol ada. Everyone say it. Migdol ada. Migdol ada. Come on, speak Hebrew. Migdol ada. This might be the holiest you've been all week. Migdol ada. Right? It literally means the tower of the flock. It was a strong point. For the flocks, watch this. It says, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. This is where the perfection of the people in the place come together. See, whenever we watch the nativity plays, we see Mary and Joseph walking through Nazareth being told there's no room for them at the inn. Right? Knock, knock, knock. I'm sorry, there's no room for you. Oh, and they walk along. Oh, there's no room for us. She's like, oh. You know, and we, we feel sorry for them, right? Right? You feel sorry for them. There's no room at the inn. Huh? And we think, man, boo, you know, that's not good. Poor Jesus, going to be born in a stable. You know, you know, he's in a manger, poor thing. And while it's true that the reality of Jesus' birth and his death are both hard and full of blood and pain, the truth is they both happen in perfect places. Watch this. The place where the angels appeared to the shepherds is traditionally known 
as the tower of the flock. But this is important. Why is this important, man? It is near Bethlehem. One commentator notes this. He says, The watchtower from ancient times was used by the shepherds for protection from their enemies and wild beasts. It was the place the ewes were brought to give birth to the lambs. These special lambs came from a unique flock which was designated the only flock, the royal flock, where the lambs would be used as the sacrifices in the temple. Now watch this. According to the Jewish commentator Alfred Edersheim, in the life of times of Jesus the Messiah, in book 2, chapter 6, this Migdal Adar was not the watchtower for the ordinary flocks that pastured on the barren sheep ground beyond Bethlehem, but it lay close to the town on the road to Jerusalem. A passage from the Mishnah, which is a Jewish book in Shechelim 7.4, leads to the conclusion that these flocks which pastured there were designated for temple sacrifices. We've got the proof, right? Watch this. So what are we, what are we to make of all this? Why is it important? First, we know that the Migdoedo was the watchtower that guarded the temple flocks that were being raised to use as sacrificial uh, offerings, right? Think about this. Think about this. Where was the baby that was going to be born here going to end up? Right? Thank God there was no room at the inn. Because if he'd have been born in the comfort of the inn, he wouldn't have qualified. Oh. And then we come to the shepherds. Why, why was it important that the shepherds would turn up? Because the shepherds were the experts in identifying which lambs were without spot or blemish that would then qualify to go into the flock from which would come the sacrifices at Passover for the sins of the people. See, sometimes we think, oh, the shepherds, poor things, you know, they're just out there, you know, low-class workers. Come on now. Uh, construction workers or, you know, the gardener. Uh, come on now. Or someone who works in a, you know, someone who works in a bakery or, you know, poor shepherds, just, just low class workers. And sometimes we look down on people that maybe are not doing what it is that we think is successful. But how many of you know, in God's eyes, these were the experts. He didn't go to the innkeeper because the innkeeper weren't qualified to check out if that lamb was right. He didn't go to the priest. The priest weren't qualified. The priests were qualified to do what the priest did. But the shepherds were the ones that were qualified to check out and see whether or not, whether or not Jesus was the real thing. They were specially educated in what an animal that was to be sacrificed had to be like. And it was their job to make sure that none of the animals were hurt, damaged, or blemished. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, it says about the lambs, it said, your lamb should be without blemish, a male of the first year. And then, when they identified the lambs, they wrapped them immediately in these cloths to keep them from getting damaged, keep them safe. And all the cloths would have been laying there. So these royal shepherds, were told by an angel to go and check out the baby in the Migdal Ada. Just as they would check out a lamb destined to become a sacrifice in the temple. And what did they decide? Verse 20 tells us. He said, the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It's the real thing. This is it. This is the real thing. This baby that has been born in that place is the real thing, man. They decided with their expertise that this little baby in that place was qualified according to the law to become a sacrifice. That's heavy, man. Huh? Behold the Lamb of God. 
Does that make things change a little bit? Because you know what that means? That means that God has a perfect place for everything he does. Huh? I don't know about you, but sometimes you might have felt like Mary and Joseph walking around thinking that this door's been shut and that door's been closed. And what about that? That, uh, that didn't open for me. And you start getting down on yourself and you start saying, well, God gave me a promise. But you know what? I went to the place that I thought that I was going to find the answer to the, to the prayer, but the door was shut. And I went to that place and I thought that's the perfect place for me. But that perfect place was closed to me. And then you start getting down on yourself. You start getting down with God. You start losing your faith. You start looking down on your situation. But you know what? The thing that you think is perfect for you is not maybe the place that God says is perfect for you. God's perfect place is God's perfect place. And just because some of you have had a door shut on you this year, it might mean that God didn't want you to linger in the wrong place. He didn't want you to get comfortable in the wrong place, but he wanted you to get into the right place so that you would be in the right place when the right people came along to identify who it is you, you really are. Help me, Jesus. Huh? Maybe it's this place. Maybe you've been here, maybe you've been there, maybe you've been in all these different places. Maybe the home is the place for you. I know it was the home for me. I thought maybe I was going to be this and I was going to be that and I was going to be this and that. But when I was in the home, some of the shepherds, they came and they looked and they said, you know what, I think you're going to be a pastor. I identify your gifts. I think that God's calling you to be a preacher. One day you're going to take a city. One day you're going to be a... It wasn't the doctor. It wasn't the lawyer. It wasn't the politician. I'm getting so excited, I'm breaking the mic. <laughs> and then what about the people? Maybe you've thought that maybe, you know, I'm not the man. Maybe I'm not the woman. Maybe it's not me. Maybe, I'm, how many of you have ever felt unnoticed? Lift up your hands. In fact, put your hand down. No one cares. No one sees you anyway, man. Someone phoned me up once and said, Pastor, I said, what's the matter? They said, Pastor, I'm really feeling rejected. I said, oh, yeah. I said, is there anyone else there I can speak to right now? You ever felt overlooked? Huh? You think that this is it? This is it, man. This is where I need to be. I need to be there. Huh? I want to be the priest. What about if God wants you to be the shepherd? I want to be the prophet. What about if he wants you to be the shepherd? I want to be the leader. I want to be the visionary. What about if he wants you to be the caretaker of the people? What about if he wants you to be the one that goes and visits the people? And because you've got that heart, you've got that gift, you've got that skill, that you can speak to people, you can love on people, you can help people. You don't have to be up here all the time. You ain't all this cracked up to be. Huh? But you feel overlooked, you feel unloved, you feel unnoticed. You're just out there in the field doing your thing. Well, that's where God found uh, David, right? All his brothers were bigger and badder and had better skills, but David was just there in the sheep, just composing psalms and looking out for the sheep and taking care of them and fighting off the lion and the bear and doing his father's business. But when the prophet came, the prophet identified something. God knows you. He knows what you got. He knows where you need to be. He knows what he wants you to do. He knows what part he wants you to play. Come on now. And it might not be the one you think, but thank God you ain't God. So what have we got so far? We got God's perfect place. Huh? There was no room at the end because God already had a perfect place assigned. Hallelujah. Huh? Then we have the perfect people. Never feel that you're too low or broken or of no use to anyone. Huh? If you've ever felt unnoticed, overlooked, unappreciated, remember the shepherds. Let Christmas remind you 
It ain't just about the gifts and singing songs and singing, singing carols and, you know, having to deal with a demon that attacks Christians' finances in the new year. You know what his name is? Bill. <laughs> Credit card Bill. Come on now. Huh? Wrestling with Bill after. Don't worry about all that stuff. Understand when you're feeling low, you're feeling unappreciated, you're feeling overlooked, you're feeling that no one knows and no one cares what you're doing. No one sees your gift. Remember the shepherds. Remember the shepherds. They were just out there in the fields minding their own business, but they saw an angel of the Lord. And then they had to go and they were the first people, the first people, the first people in the universe outside of Mary and Joseph to see Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God manifest on the earth. You don't start getting down on yourself because you might be the first one to do something new. You might be the first one in your family, in your neighborhood. You might be the first one in your lineage to do this. Then we got the plan. Let's finish with the plan. God's perfect plan. You know, you don't have to try and get perfection in Christ. That when you're in Christ, you're in perfection. You're in a perfect place. It's complete. Teleos is the word in Hebrews. It speaks about perfection. It means a, a job done, a task finished, something completed. Now, if you know, when you're in Christ, you're in perfection. You don't have to work for it. You work from it. You don't have to work to be accepted. You're accepted. Work from that. You don't have to work for your salvation. You've got salvation. Work out your salvation. You don't have to work it in. This plan, God's plan, has always been to have a human family, a terrestrial family of the earth. He's already got a celestial family, right? He wants a terrestrial family. Are you with me? But the first human, Adam, messed it up. His wife messed it up. Come on now. She got him to mess it up. You know, Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. Snake didn't have a leg to stand on. You know the story. The way he messed it up was this. Watch this. He chose what most people today are choosing. Autonomy. Self-rule. My opinion, this is what I feel like doing. This is what I feel like being. This is what I think is right. It's autonomy, self-rule. And that released the disease of sin into the human race. And that in turn gave, gave birth to death. There was no death before this. Forget all that billions of years of evolution. The dinosaurs died out. That would have meant that the Bible was rubbish. There was no death before Adam. Are you with me? That means there was no dinosaurs died before Adam. I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail, but work it out. Huh? And that choice separated him and all his descendants from the life of the creator God and death entered humanity. This selfish choice could be reversed, but a payment was going to be needed in the form of a sacrifice. But the one that lost the whole thing messed it all up as a human. So it had to be a human to come and pay the price. But no human was sinless. You know, there's only one time in the Bible where it speaks the word sinless, anamatos. And that's when the woman is caught in adultery. You know the story? And Jesus said, whoever, without, whoever is among you who is without sin, anamatos, sinless, cast the first stone. And he was the only one that could say it because he's the only one that's ever been without sin. Everyone walked away, man. They looked at it. They walked away. Are you with me? But it had to be a human, sinless human who could pay the price, who could make the sacrifice. And the son of, so the Son of God became human. He entered this world, someone said, through a virgin's womb under a sign that said no entrance. Right in the perfect place to become the perfect sacrifice examined by the perfect experts to pay the eternal price for human failure. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 says this. It says, For you know that God paid a ransom 
to save you from the empty life you inherited. Come on now. You can get all the stuff in the world. You can have the biggest house, the shiniest car, the nicest boots, the longest nails. Come on now. You can have all the outside stuff, but if inside it's empty and futile, there, it don't matter. I've seen the richest people, the most depressed. Come on now, you see rich people jumping out of buildings and taking overdoses. Having stuff on the outside can never make up for what's missing on the inside. And the thing on the inside that's missing is because a connection's been broken. It's like having this, this iPad. It'll work for a while without being plugged in because it has an internal battery. But one day that battery runs out and then it's just a useless lump of metal and glass. You need to have it plugged back in. You need to have it connected to the source of all power. And that's what Jesus Christ comes and he does. That's what he did. That's why he was born. That's why he was born in that place. That's why he was born. And he was identified by those people. And it's, that's what Christmas is all about, my friend. And the greatest gift in the world is being plugged back in by Jesus' blood to the source of all life. The ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Jesus. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God. I want you to stand to your feet with me. I want you to change your mind in this place. I want to, I, I, I'm asking for a spirit of repentance to come upon this whole place. Repentance ain't a bad thing. It's not a thing that you have to do when you've been caught out, when you've messed up, when you've slipped and you've fallen. Repentance is changing your way of thinking about something. Changing the, your paradigm, changing the grid that you see things through. And this Christmas, you need to change your grid. You need to change your grid. You might be disappointed that you ain't got the money you need to get the gifts that you want. But how many of you know you've got the greatest gift of all? You have the Word of God. You have eternal life. You've got the Holy Spirit. People don't need your traditions. Your family going to come. They're going to get gifts that they don't need. You're going you're gonna, you're gonna to be paying, paying, paying for gifts that people don't even want with money you ain't even got to impress people that don't even care. But I mean, if you know what it is that you have, you have eternal life. You have faith in Jesus Christ. You have the love of God. You have a prayer life. Come on now. People need the truth. They don't want, to, they don't want you to bash them around with it. They want you to be it. Lift up your hands. This can be the best Christmas ever. This could be the one that makes sense. This can be the one where you don't feel guilty. You don't just want to get it done. You don't just want to get by. You don't just want to get it over. This is the one that you can remember that Jesus Christ is who He says He is. He did what He said He would do in the place that the Bible said it would happen. Father, in this place right now, we ask, oh God, that you would help us to change the way we see things. Give us eternal eyes. Give us eyes that see beyond the natural. Help us to remember, oh God, what it is that you've done in our lives. We forget so easy. We get caught up in the glitz and the glamour and the gloss. We get caught up in the hype. Help us. If God's spoken to you, I know time's gone. Just lift up your hands and begin to thank the Lord and begin to worship Him in this place. Come on. Thank Him. Think of the shepherds. Thank God that He knows who you are. He knows your gift. He knows your expertise. And He's going to use you. Oh, don't worry about it. It's coming. If He ain't using you yet, He's going to use your life. Get in the right place. Get in the right place. Come on, worship Him. Come on, lift your hands, everybody. Jesus. 